Hello, world changers. I hope you're all well. Welcome to the Change Your World podcast. I'm Susie Bowman, a personal development consultant and founder of Change Your World, a health and happiness organization to support you to create the life that you really want to live. And today I'm joined by Randy Fine, who is a professional narcissist abuse counsellor and author of Close Encounters of the Worst Kind. This is week three in our series on the Survivor's Guide to Narcissistic Abuse. Now, the reason we're teaming up together for this podcast series is because if, like us, you are or have been on the receiving end of narcissistic abuse, you will know how destructive it can be. Now, knowing the signs to look out for, myself and Randy both believe narcissistic personality disorders are more prevalent in society than are reported. And this is because a narcissist will never, ever put themselves forward for analysis or assessment because they just don't believe that there's anything wrong with them. They believe it's everyone else's fault and that everyone else is wrong. But also they must protect the false self at all costs and never, ever reveal their true self. And this is what a psychological assessment would do. So our aim is to educate you because if you know the signs to look out for, you're less likely to become a victim to abuse. Also, understanding this disorder will help you manage and heal from any narcissistic abuse you may have encountered. So welcome, Randy. It's lovely to see Hi. you again. Hi, Susie. Great to be back. Yeah. Thank you lovely for having me have back. You joining it's us always... all the way from sunny Florida. Florida, yep. Yeah. Hot, sunny, humid Florida. Yeah, I bet you've got <laughs> the fans blowing on you. I have the air. I run the air. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's not so something happy. we uh, have to uh, worry about here in Scotland, I can assure you. But just, the sun is shining today, so it's all good. Yeah, that's good. Um, so today we are going to talk about the different traits and behaviours that you find in narcissists. And my understanding is that there is a common thread, common set of basics that a narcissist will um, present, but it can show up differently in parents, in work colleagues, romantic relationships and friendships. So that's what we're going to explore today. And what would happen if you decided to cut that relationship and cut that fuel supply? So let's start by exploring what the basics are, uh, the, the common threads that would give you a sort of indicator if you are dealing with a narcissist. Okay. The first thing is how you feel. That's really the biggest thing, because when you're around a narcissist, your brain is going to scramble. You're going to be confused. You're going to feel disoriented and you're not going to know why. And when you think about it in uh, in logical terms, it's not going to make sense to you. So this is a big one that I really want people to, you know, what people tend to do is they distrust themselves. They distrust their feelings. They distrust their reactions and they want to um, sort of, you know, excuse the other person and say it's them. It's they're just having this experience. So that's really the first thing. Mm. Um, narcissists are liars and manipulators and a narcissist will lie whether they have to or not. They lie about everything. If they're speaking, they are lying. And the problem is that there's always kernels of truth mm -hmm. in those lies that you can maybe grab a piece of it and say, well, it could be. So it sounds plausible. So they, they tell the truth enough for it to sound plausible, but there's that gut feeling inside of you where you're going, hmm, Something doesn't quite add up, but that's the crazy making behavior, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It is. So, yeah. And but if somebody is constantly doing this with you, yeah. If if you're constantly feeling like you're needing to make heads or tails out of what they're saying, or something isn't right, something doesn't add up, and you're and you find yourself letting it go 
just constantly saying, all right, well, it's me. Well, it's me. Well, it's me. It's not you <laughs> because normal people don't challenge us in the challenge us in this way. So these are uh, two of the really main hallmarks of what you'll feel around a narcissist. But there are many tactics that narcissists use and they all use them. All of them. The biggest one is um, we've all heard of gaslighting or ambient abuse. See, this is funny. This term gaslighting, uh, until I was on the receiving end of uh, a narcissistic abuse, I, I, I kind of vaguely heard this term, but I didn't know what it meant. And it took me a while to kind of really sort of understand. So, you know, let's, ex- let's really explore that gaslighting because that is a big part of what a narcissist will do to you. It is. And, you know, I'm hearing gaslighting coming out of politicians. Oh. I'm hearing it on the news. People are sitting, people are like using the term now. Yeah. They're using the, the term now. So it's getting to be a little more mainstream. But um, there are, let's see. Okay, so there's five different kinds of gaslighting that's used. Ooh. And this is going to sort of separate it all for you. Okay. Um, okay. So one of them is called withholding. And this is where um, the abuser acts confused and pretends that he or she doesn't understand what the victim is telling him. I'm, I'm laughing because um, I'm in yeah. my head going, yeah, clock. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, the, and the narcissist will say things like, why are you trying to confuse me? Or you're not making any sense or, or I'm just not going to listen to you. Or how can I possibly remember that? Um, Or, you know, I have a lot on my mind. Stop bothering me. Um, It's so disrespectful to be on the receiving end of that because it's so, it's, you're not worthy. You, I'm not going to validate you. You, you you offer no value. You're just talking nonsense. You're talking rubbish. And right. It, and you're wasting my time. Yeah. And that really can have a really horrendous ripple effect on you, that impact that that can have. Because over time, one scenario, you can get over that. You just think, oh, it was an exchange between the two, the confusion. But when that's repeatedly happening day in, day out, then you really start to doubt yourself and become a shell of yourself. Yes, it, it does. It, um, it diminishes you. And, you know, they say things like, I don't have answers for you, or I don't know what you want me to say. <laughs> you know, how would I know? These kind of things that are so dismissing that after a while you think, well, these are just stupid questions. Why am I saying this? Why do I bother to say this? Uh, I might as well just shut up mm-hmm. because... You know, I'm actually, I'm absolutely annoying this person. So it makes you feel like it's your fault. Mm. The, um, the second one is called countering. And um, this is when the abuser questions the memory and thoughts of its target. And then it supports their argument with some kind of previous example. So it would be like, um, you never remember things correctly. Or, um, you know, I never said that. You always exaggerate things. Get your facts straight. (laughs) You know, you take everything the wrong way. You you know, you, you have a very active imagination. These are all right out of the narcissistic handbook right out of it. Um, or remember how wrong you were the last time. So this is called countering. This is another kind of of gaslighting. The third one is blocking or diverting. And this is where the narcissist refuses to answer or comment on what you're saying, or they change the subject. Um, They fault the victim for accusing or blaming him or her, uh, or they fault the victim for reacting the way they did. So they'll say things like, I'm not going through this again. Um, Or where did you get such an idiotic idea? Mm. Or why can't you leave well enough alone? Um, Or you're always looking for trouble. You're always picking fights. Um, Or we already talked about this or, you know, or you always have to be right. 
So this is blocking or diverting. Or is it even projecting whatever? So if you were accusing the person of doing something and they flip it and project it right back and say, I think you'll find that that's what you're doing. So in a romantic relationship, if you were cheating or accusing your partner of cheating, they would flip it and actually accuse you. And then you end up defending yourself going, no, I didn't do that. I would never do that. And and then it takes the limelight away from their actions. Right. Absolutely. It's, they do deflect it or divert it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. So then the fourth one is trivializing. Um, This is when the narcissist makes the thoughts and feelings and needs of the target unimportant. So they would say something like, um, why would something so stupid come between us? Or you're just too sensitive. That's a big one. Yeah. Um, or, <laughs> <We told that. laughs> or get your priorities straight. Um, you always blow things out of proportion. Um, stop analyzing everything. Yeah. Told that too. <laughs> Stop analyzing everything, um, you know, or why do you let everything get to you? So they're trivializing your position, your feelings. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is forgetting and denial. And um, that's when the narcissist denies that things ever happened or denies promises that, um, that they made to the victim and um and it they use it to prevent the um the victim from getting resolution so they would say something like i never said that or i never did that or that never happened that's a Mm -hmm. big one that never happened um or i've never been there before yeah um And that really is crazy making because when you know, and even when you've got the evidence in front, uh, not even in front of you, or you know it's on an email, you know, if somebody said, I never said that, and you're like, I've got an email stating, (laughs) I've got it, and you present it to them, and they're like, Nope, I didn't write that. (laughs) You're like, It came from your email, you know. Exactly. It is crazy making. And because you can't do anything with that. Because the person, the narcissist, will sit there and go, nope, that didn't happen. Nope, didn't happen. And you, you, you're like, it's there. And they're, they're just so confident in their resolve and their response that you just go, I don't know what to do with this because I'm, I don't want to use the word normal person, but okay. in a normal exchange, the person would be like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I forgot I even sent that email. And, gosh, now you've brought it to my attention I can only apologize. I'm sorry. You know, but they're like, nope, didn't happen. (laughs) It's there, like a light. (laughs) Um, They'll say, um, you're making that up. You're delusional. Or they'll say, there's nothing wrong with my memory. Mm. Um, You're confusing me with someone else. Yeah. These are, you know, you never, I, I never promised you that. Uh, this is this happens a lot in the workplace because uh, like a narcissistic boss will get you to be a slave for them by promising you either some kind of promotion or raise or something like that. There's, you know, you just put in the time now and it'll it'll pay off later, you know, or you know, I'm going to give you a, a big bonus or a big raise at the end. And so then the person slaves and slaves and slaves and slaves. And slaves and the boss says, I never told you I was going to do that. Yeah. After you've already, you know, given and your is blood that- that thing, in fact, before we move on, because I realize I never said this in the intro, if anybody's listening to this and they suddenly think, oh, my God, I think I might be dealing with a narcissist, whatever role that is, you are available for support. So you can find out more at randyvine.com and, you know, you can help people navigate through these challenging relationships. You've also got your book, Close Encounters of the Worst Kind, which has been an absolute lifesaver for myself and my partner as we navigate 
the narcissistic abuse we've been on the receiving end of. Mm. But the, it's that thing, it's, uh, there's two words, <laughs> everything you were describing there, validation and accountability, that were the two words that kind of sprung up here, or uh, even responsibility. They, the narcissist is taking no responsibility. There's no accountability. You can't pin them down on anything. And they don't validate your concerns, your emotions, your feelings, anything. So those three things combined just leave you, one, with nowhere to go other than cutting the relationship. But <clears throat> if you don't understand what you're on the receiving end of and what's happening, you think you're at fault. And it can, if it goes on long enough, can absolutely have a detrimental effect on your mental health and happiness and your well-being. Sure. And this is, I think, th this is why we're both so passionate about this, because it's a subject that is, isn't understood. And it, we're, because we're not talking about physical abuse, I mean, there can be physical abuse, but it's a psychological abuse. The gaslighting that you spoke about there, you know, the five different types. I mean, that, I mean, what, what will we see? I mean, you work with people all the time that have been on years of receiving end of this. Yeah. What, what do you see in your, your, I don't want to call them victims. I want to call them survivors. Survivors. They are survivors. Yeah. One of the things, one of the first things I see is the very first time someone works with me, very first session, they'll tell me their story. Cause I always say, just start talking. Just tell me your story. And they'll tell me some horrendous things and then they'll stop and they'll say, did any of that make sense? <laughs> it's really common. So they don't even realize it's <laughs> that um, the frog, the, the story of the frog, you put them in cold water and, you know, well, put them in boiling water and they jump out, obviously, because it's boiling water. But if you put them in colder water and then turn up the heat and slowly boil them, yeah. the frog doesn't realize it's been boiled alive. Exactly. You know? um, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, they're, they doubt their perceptions. Um, they're not even sure that they've been abused. They're really, really foggy on what has happened to them. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, they're taking way more responsibility for the demise of the relationship than they need to. Because, in fact, they really don't need to take any responsibility for it. But that's not something in our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Healthy minded people. Um, always see their part yeah. in everything that they do. So the tendency is for us to figure out what our part is in this. And often we take way too much credit for it. But the truth is there's, when you're with a, a, a narcissist, you have no part in it whatsoever, whatsoever because the relationship it, itself was built on a lie. Manipulation. On false foundations, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was. And so you got sucked into something that you did not sign up for, even though you think you did, you did not. Yeah. So, so the next thing is stonewalling. And, um, you know, when it's okay in a normal, healthy relationship, if you are having an argument and, the, and you, <clears throat> you need to step away. You need to say, you know, let me just cool down and we'll come back and do this. Um, but stonewalling is deliberately used to shut somebody down or control them. Um, it's supposed it's used to prevent things from happening. So, like, you may say, um, you know, uh, whatever your famous star is, whatever your musical idol is whatever mm -hmm. they're coming to town in july and i want to get tickets it's early now i really want i just heard about it i really want to get tickets because i want to get a great seat and all that and they'll say okay no problem you know let me look into it mm -hmm. and then you don't hear anything <clears throat> and then you bring it up another week later and they're, they're like oh yeah 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 i forgot about uh, let me look into it and what they'll do is they'll stall to the point where there's no tickets available and then you're screwed or <clears throat> they'll promise you a vacation 
and they'll get the kids excited. They'll get everybody really excited. And then right before it's supposed to happen, they'll say, you've all been bad. The children have been bad and we're not going. We're not going. It's your fault. We're not going. And meanwhile, the children are like devastated. Yeah. So <clears throat> stonewalling is walking away with no explanation while the other person is trying to discuss the matter. So this is why I said, you know, in a healthy relationship, you, you give that person the, uh, the respect of listening to what they have to say. You may not like it, but you don't just walk away. Um, or they refuse to discuss or collaborate on something that's important to the other person. Uh, I was just going <clears> to <throat> say, you know, all these traits, not so much, well, uh, they may, maybe it could be put down to being absent-minded, going, yeah, yeah, I will, a genuine intention, I will look into it, and then, you know, stress, life, busy, blah, 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 and then, you know, it doesn't happen, and, you know, tickets could sell out because you've been absent-minded, but it's when it, repeatedly happens yes. you know in different types of scenarios so you know if everybody's thinking oh my god my partner does that i'm constantly asking my partner to do that and he's always forgetting you know it's it's more you know combine it with all the other things it's right. not just exactly. in isolation we should point mm -hmm. that out right you will see the stonewalling taking place in many different ways you're going to see it happening in all these different strategies um not only just that, but and that and this is how this is why they get away with these things, because yeah. they're anybody could forget and they know that. Yeah, I, I mean, I know, I'm thinking of one client I've worked with and they was telling me that their partner after an argument, when um, he confronted her, she would literally give him the silent treatment for days to the point where he just got so fed up and he would just be like, oh, do you know, look, he'd end up apologizing. And then, you know, then they could move on with the life and it was never to be talked about again. And, you know, but, and, it, you know, I sort of said, well, what would happen if you didn't capitulate and give in? And so the silent treatment would still be going on. I mean, they would go on for weeks and weeks, just not talking. <laughs> Just, I was like, I, how do you comprehend that? You know, how do you live with that? It's just not a, a healthy functioning relationship. But no. it, it would go no. on. You know, the longest they said they ever did it was four days and they cracked. It just couldn't. It was just ridiculous. You know, it's it was just, way harder for the victim to deal with the silent treatment than it is the rage. But the silent okay. treatment, it's called pernicious um, rage. So it's the actual opposite of the loud rage. Pernicious is when they go into this silent treatment. And a lot of it is meant to solicit supply because eventually you're going to grovel. Mm -hmm. And that's where they want you. They want you to be <laughs> taking that low, you know, stance. That groveling. I'm pro and you're apologizing for something you didn't do. And they're getting fed. So great. That's like it's the, the biggest deal. Again. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, so another thing, um, snowballing, drawing out a problem longer than necessary so the other person can't get a satisfactory answer or resolution, which is what I was saying, or find an alternative solution. Um, <clears throat> accusing the other person of not making sense or talking too much to justify tuning her out for him. Pretending to listen to the other person without offering a response. That's I mean, when you're hearing this said out so loud, I mean, I can feel it. I'm like cringing, just thinking this is so disrespectful, so toxic. It is. You know, horrible. a horrible way to treat a person. It is. And what it does is it breaks you down because everything is meant to make you feel wrong. Yeah. Stupid. Yeah. Annoying. Unimportant. You know, it's, yeah. Right. It's made to make you think that you are an instigator, that you're a, a weak little sensitive person who can't handle anything. I mean, it's 
it, it's the messages that it sends to you are, are, they change the way that you think about yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, permanently change it. And um, this is why when you're coming out of a relationship like this, you've got to get help because you are not seeing things clearly. And this isn't something that goes away with time. This is brainwashing. Yeah. This is um, deliberate dripping mm -hmm. of brainwashing to the point where you don't know who you are. Like people will say to me, um, Randy, I just got out of this relationship and I, I go to the grocery store and I can't figure out which loaf of bread to buy. I can't make a decision. I can't. Why is that? I can't make a decision. So um, a couple more things. Let's see. Oh, the other one is acting tired, bored, or uninterested in what the person has to say. So it's like you'll be telling them something really deep and serious, and they'll be like, well, something really good that happened to you that day, like a promotion at work or an right. award that you're passing an exam or whatever it might be. They'd be like, mm hmm. Yeah, whatever. Pick up the book, start reading the newspaper, watch the television, whatever it is. So this it's is just um, that constant dismissing your significance, isn't it? Yeah. It's right. Horrible. Right. So there's so much that the narcissist does. And, and what's truly amazing about this is that this comes very naturally to them. There's not even a thought. Not even a thought. They don't process these things. They don't think, all right, well, now I'm going to do this or now I'm going to do that. This is the pathology, the nature of the pathology of this disorder, which shows you they are completely wired differently than we are. Mm. It's not the same kind of brain. We can't do these things. We can do maybe one or two of them once in a while, occasionally. But even when we do them, we feel bad. We have some sense of responsibility or guilt. Um, but these just, they just come to them just like this. So is that part of the brain, like the, the, the conscious part of the brain that keeps you and your moral compass, you know, it, it keeps your moral compass in balance? And is that just not there? Is it being damaged? Is it being bypassed with the, the wiring? Is, you know, what's going on? It's not there. It's not there because um, just as it wouldn't be there with uh, a virtual lover, <laughs> somebody that you're, you know, something that's been programmed, virtual reality or something like that, they don't have it. They only have what is programmed into them, what they've learned, but they, they don't go beyond that. So you're dealing with the false self. And this is, this is what is so crucial. And I try to say this a lot because we think that we're dealing with another human being. Mm. Well, that human being, it looks like a human being because it came into this world as a human being, but the psychologically, emotionally, mentally, that human being is just died a long time ago and has sent out this facade, this false self into the world. So what you're dealing with is not a person. They don't process they're not a real person. They're, they don't have a self-identity. All they are is an army for the true self. Their job is to never let the true self feel anything. And so they will do anything, anything. There's no limit to what they will do to make sure the true self never feels that self-loathing, um, goes to that self-loathing place that causes them, cause them to develop this disorder in, initially in the beginning. And we did. We spoke about this in week one and week two. Just that thing of them very much being a robot, that artificial intelligence. You know, very clever, very smart, learning how they should behave in society, learning the right things to say at the appropriate time when people are around, but a complete incapacity to function with empathy, compassion. Love. Normal responses, uh, you know, human responses, the things that do really make us human. Yes. Um, I'm conscious time is ticking on. So let's explore the different um, 
personalities or different characters. So, you know, parents, okay. work, work colleagues. Let's start actually with work colleagues um, because, I, you know, I see this when I'm delivering stress management workshops and doing my corporate training. I see this in the workplace now and I didn't used to. And now like when I'm hearing some of the behaviors that are going on, that's causing conflict in the workplace, I'm like, oh, right. Okay. We're dealing with a narcissist. Okay. And it's like how, you know, trying to even introduce that concept because it's massive, you know, and what do you even do with it when you're dealing with particularly a line manager or, you know, CEO, uh, you know, they're, you know, they're in charge. They're running a team of people. So how would we see narcissism playing out in the workplace in that kind of situation? Well, for one thing, you won't feel like you're in a team. You'll feel like there's a dictator and everyone else is scrambling around to make that person happy or look good. You'll find that you are never acknowledged for your ideas, but your ideas may be stolen. Uh, they may speak for you. They, you. You may come up with a great idea, share it, and then all of a sudden it becomes theirs. Uh, it's all about them. And narcissistic bosses, uh, CEOs, they will just continually step on people. They, they, they work their way up by smashing people, stepping on them, stepping on them, stepping, stepping on them till they get to where they uh, are in a position of power. And, you know, the average person cannot, we can't do that. We don't hurt people to further our success. But they wouldn't do that to everybody because they have to charm. I mean, they start off quite charming to everybody because they've got to get you on side. Mm-hmm. And then they would pick off the ones that they're going to manipulate and target for their fuel supply. True. And then, and the others will be, we haven't discussed that, the flying monkeys. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So they get, they get a, they rally people around them who want to please them, who want to kiss up to them because they, they think they're going to benefit from that. Mm-hmm. And so, they have all these people that are, are going to um, speak up or speak well of them. But in the meantime, there are, there's always going to be someone that they have destroyed to get where they are, completely destroyed. But that said, a narcissist at the head of a company, a CEO of a corporation, um, that is not a long-term thing because the narcissist will totally bring the organization down eventually because there's no, they don't care about the organization. They only care about how they look and building their resume so they can move on to the next one. So um, we see this with it, politicians as well. We see them oh, yeah. absolutely, you know, a, a, a party could be doing quite well and, they will absolutely destroy it with the, destroy them. <laughs> the way they carry on, you know, you know. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Gosh, exactly. And then that's when you, you know, another party gets elected in. And of course, if there's a narcissist running that, we just go through the cycle again, again and again. And that's the, what it is. Yeah. The, the interesting thing and this, uh, so there's a term love bombing, and this is often used um, in romantic relationships that when you get into or start dating a narcissist, they right. will absolutely love bomb you. But I think that phase happens in all stages, you know, whether it's your, I mean, obviously your parents are slightly different, but friendships, work colleagues, um, or, you know, boss and uh, teams mm-hmm. and, you know, romantic. It's that, that stage where you're absolutely charmed. You're, you, you know, you're made to feel wonderful. You're really put up on this pedestal. And then the, you know, it's it, like you say, they've determined, okay, they're going to be my flying monkeys. They're going to be one that's going to support this campaign. These are going and these are going to be my targets for my fuel supply because they have certain traits that, they, is that, does a narcissist very quick to identify that so they can break them down? 
very quickly. So yeah. it's almost like a, like they sniff them out. They know immediately. Um, and it may be through conversations. It may be through questions they ask or things they hear them say, you know, they're looking for the weak link. They're looking for that weak gazelle in the herd of gazelles. You know, they're looking for that one that they can prey on. But it also happens among coworkers. And what will happen is, so there'll be a team of people that are working really well together and then someone else will come in and they'll start off by, you know, wanting to be part of the team. And they'll be like, you know, give me all the inside information of what I need to know to exist here, you know, and then you kind of all bring them in on the fold and everything like that. And they, then they work on the boss and they'll start buying coffee for the boss. They start kissing up to the boss and making themselves noticed. And so they're at the same time that they're gathering information, they are then um, getting closer and closer to the boss and showing themselves to be invaluable to that person. So that when everything falls apart in the team and people start pointing their finger at them, the boss is going to say, I think they're lovely. They're doing a wonderful job. So they play it on both ends and they generally will target um, the person in in that office or team that is doing the most. So, so say um, when they start the, the supervisor or whatever, will say to them, you know, I really want you to hang out with so-and-so Linda, because Linda knows everything. She knows all the ropes, you know, she's like my number one person, you know, she's a good mentor for you. Well, that's when they decide Linda's going down. Linda's going down because now I need to take that place. So they will systematically do things to make her look bad. And also to subtly um, to start triangulating in the office and and start turning the coworkers, telling them things about this person that are lies, but then they begin to believe it. Yeah. And so they make her look bad and bad and bad and bad to the point where she has no way to. So give us an example of triangulation, because I think uh, I've certainly, I've experienced this myself in the workplace, but I've all, you know, I've seen it as well. And I see it (laughs) in our governments as well, just Mm -hmm. playing two sets of people off against each other and <clears throat> just sitting back and going, no, I'll just watch the show now, you know, and just letting people destroy each other because of this dynamic that they've set up. So in my book, In Close Encounters, I give an example of, um, <clears throat> so in the workplace, so this, say this, this Linda comes in and <clears throat> Linda decide she's going to have an outing. She's going to have a barbecue or a picnic for the group. She sends out emails to everybody and invites them, but she doesn't send it to the one person. And she tells each person, don't say anything because I'm not inviting everybody. So everybody thinks they're special and that they're coming and they don't, nobody talks about it among the, in the office. <clears throat> but she doesn't send it to that one person. And when they all are there and they say, oh, where is Linda? She'll say, Linda said she couldn't waste her weekend on being with us. (laughs) So manipulative. Right? See? So then everybody's thinking, oh, you know, Linda's too good good for us. Mm -hmm. Right, she's too good for us. Meanwhile, Linda had no idea this was even going on. So, and how do you even recover from that? Because, you know, if one of the colleagues said to Linda, right, oh, why weren't you there at the weekend? She's like, I didn't know anything about it. Oh, yeah, sure, right. You know, she's just yeah. not going to be believed. Right. So it's clever. I mean, <laughs> I kind of feel like we're giving ideas, but the narcissist has got this covered. They know this already. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we couldn't do this. And first of all, it would take us a while to even think about how yeah. to orchestrate this. They do it. Even, I mean, this is the difference. I mean, we 
all of us have narcissistic traits. We have narcissistic moments. And there are times like if somebody crosses us or upsets us, angers us, we have those moments where you might have revengeful thoughts or I should have said this, I should have done this. or And you might, you know, go off into a daydream where you think, oh, I can get them back this way. But then you stop and you self-check yourself and you say, oh, for goodness sake, get over yourself. And you realise the repercussions. You realise that's not me. That would hurt. That's horrible. And you don't do it. That's it. You know, right. the difference is a narcissist will carry out that abhorrent behaviour. Right. Yeah. And what you just described is our, is us processing our thoughts, our pl- making trying to make a plan in our mind, analysing it, and then... destructing it and, um, you know, and realizing the repercussions. That's something that we don't do in an instant. Mm. You know, we have to really, it takes takes us some time to process that. Uh, A narcissist creates a plan like that in a nanosecond. It's just there. It's just there. They know. um, And they go straight from zero to inflicts as much pain as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And they know exactly how they're going to do it. Um, and so there's a, there's a brilliance there that we absolutely do not have the capacity for. We our brains don't work this way. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, so that's the workplace. It's yeah. worrying when uh, a narcissist gets in power when because of the destruction they can cause. I mean, they cause destruction wherever they are, but if they're in a powerful position, mm-hmm. uh, it's devastating for anybody that's in the fallout of that. It's like a a nuclear bomb going off. The fallout from it is huge. It's like, yeah, it's not just the targeted people because other people become enablers and targets and part of the, the the flying monkeys are just as much victims of it as well. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So So, there's, there's, um, there's something called the dark triad, which is a lot of what we see in these, uh, corporate situations are in the government. <clears throat> the dark triad is a combination of narcissistic personality disorder, Machiavellianism, and um, antisocial behavior. And so the Machiavellianism is the, the, you know, this was from Prince Machiavelli and from years ago. And his motto was get them before they get you because they're going to get you. So you might as well get them first. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the, the philosophy of that kind of person. And then you have the antisocial who um, is just sadistic for sadistic sake. And so you can have somebody who's a dark triad who has all three of those things um, and they are pure evil. I mean, they, they are way more destructive than any narcissist alone can be. But often you'll find in government and in corporations that you'll have somebody like that. Or you could just have a Machiavellian person who is um, who just their philosophy is you're going to get me if I don't get you. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> it's scary. <laughs> real life because when you start recognizing the signs you too i promise you because when i started reading up about narcissism and personality disorders i actually you know <clears throat> started seeing it everywhere and i was like oh my gosh this is way more prevalent than i thought and that and i started recognizing it in lots of kind of relationships and family members and the workplace. And I was thinking, I've been on the receiving end of this before, you know, I hadn't, it was only because this certain situation had become so extreme that, you know, it was almost like I was being slapped across the face. So you need to wake up and recognize this, but I recognize I'd been on it previously. And probably if uh, our listeners are thinking, starting to think, "Mm, yeah, I've got a narcissist in my life. You've probably had it before especially if you're dealing with an extreme case you've probably had it before also right and it's why it's why i say i think without i have no way to back this up except my my impression um or my experience but i think one out of four people has this disorder um 
it's so prevalent that when you begin to understand, all, like you're saying, mm. all the signs, you'll go, you oh, my it. gosh, oh, yeah. I've been yeah. up against this. That's what she's going through. That's what he's going through. That explains this. That explains that child who, you know, who's lost, who's now on drugs. Who's, mm-hmm. I mean, it explains so much. Yeah. There. I want to go on to the romantic relationship. I'm con- conscious time is ticking away. When I talk about romantic relationships and m- probably focus on what happens when you try and walk away from that, because I think it, it, we will explore. I do want to explore parents as well and what cutting the supply does. But I think a romantic relationship, especially if children are involved, mm. that is the hardest one to to walk away from. Because the workplace, yes, eventually you can get another job, perhaps, or hopefully the narcissist will leave. There are there's other things at play. But when you're in that relationship and you're being systematically and psychologically broken down every day to the point where you don't even know yourself, don't have any confidence in yourself, then it's really, it, it's, it's hard to think, how do you even navigate out of that? So let's look at first how, let's talk about the love bombing in a bit more um, okay. uh, detail about how a narcissist will target you in a romantic in the dating scene. Okay. So the love bombing is a very real thing. It's how the narcissist captures their hostage, emotional hostage, which we call a relationship. We think we're getting into a relationship when, in fact, it's an emotional hostage situation. They're capturing us. Um, and they're going to hold us, keep us in a, an emotional holding pattern. You know, And not only do narcissists brainwash, but they also use psychological warfare. So psychological warfare would be something that um, – that the the armed services will use to interrogate prisoners of war. Things like um, <clears throat> keeping the light on for constant and then constantly playing loud music. Oh, yeah. What the narcissist will do is they'll be in your ear. They'll speak all night to you, yell all night to you. That's psychological warfare. They do things like that. But anyway, the love bombing is where they are in the stage of looking for their um, their next victim, their next emotional hostage. And so... And they're, they're constantly on the lookout. It doesn't... Constantly. I mean, they will have their main emotional supply uh, um, hostage, but they have all the flying monkeys and their other sources. It, it's constant. They need right. a constant filling up, don't they? Constant, right. <clears throat> because it, they're never sati- satiated. So... The, um, and often, often they're having affairs in these relations, outside of these relationships. Is that true for, is that just, I mean, I don't want to stereotype, but, I, but I'm going to. <laughs> is that more a male trait in a, the, to have affairs? Do women have affairs too? Women have affairs, but that's not a given. With a male narcissist, it's a given. It's a given. They're going to do that. And not only do they have, if they're apparently heterosexual, they will not just be heterosexual in their affairs. All right. They will see male prostitutes. They'll be soliciting men on they'll, anything. They will do anything. They're generally very perverse. Um, and yeah, so they're, they're, they're really uh, pretty disgusting in that way. So if you are with, if you know you're with a, a, a male narcissist, you better stop sleeping with them because they're dirty. You don't know where they have been. And it's scary because they, they go to some really awful places. But the love bombing is where, um, so they're looking for this primary source of narcissistic supply. Let's just call it that. And they're feeling different situations out. They're looking for the vulnerability that they can prey on. And that vulnerability can come for different reasons, but generally, generally, the most common one is the person who is empathetic, empathic, uh, very forgiving, 
um, someone who looks for the potential in others rather than seeing them for who they are, someone who suffers from codependency, uh, someone who um, they, um, what is it? Yeah, they look for the, it, it's about really looking for the best in others rather than seeing the worst in them. OK, and this is something that a lot of us do. We want to think that humankind is yeah. beautiful and wonderful and everything is wonderful. And we're going to look for the <clears throat> best in people um, that may have worked in the 60s and the 50s. It doesn't work now. Yeah, you kind of make excuses for their behavior constantly. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't work now. You can't do that. You have to look at the person for who they are and analyze them. But anyway, they're looking for someone that they feel they can lie to and manipulate. But it's basically what they're looking for is a vulnerability that they can capitalize on. So it could be like I had a client who was married for over 30 years. She had a wonderful marriage to a man. He died. She's now out there in the dating world. She has no uh, armor in the dating world. Mm -hmm. And she immediately gets picked off by a narcissist. Because she's because, vulnerable, because she's grieving. She's lost the love of her life. Yeah. She, right. And she doesn't, you know, and yeah, she's looking for someone and, um, and she doesn't have that armor, that, you know, the resilience. So that can happen as well. Terrible though. I mean, honestly, I do look for the best in people. I am, I am guilty of that. And I just, you know, it, it kind of breaks my heart a little bit when I just think, oh God, you've got to go out there with armor on, you know, because already your defenses are up because you can't just be your authentic true self for fear of somebody manipulating you. you and can. it's, you know, it, it, it actually makes me feel really sad. Is this the way our world is, you know, what it's coming to. It really, yeah. You know, and I don't want anybody to, to think that those are traits that are not beautiful and wonderful, you know, because I'm kind and understanding and forgiving and all of those things. I, I'm all of those things, you know, but you, you have to be discerning. Yeah. It's, it's the healthy boundaries, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's boundaries, right? You have to know as soon as something's, strikes you the wrong way you've got to be like uh -uh, I'm going a different way or you're not for me or whatever and you or even just uh, you know saying stating that healthy boundary and saying oh sorry that's my doorbell um stating that healthy boundary absolutely it's uh, why boundaries are so very important in this world we must have self-love we have to have self-esteem and we have to have a boundary system the boundary system is tells you or, or lets you define where you let off and others begin. So there's no merging into you. You know, you have this, this set of what feels right and wrong to you. You know, there are no exact ways to say this is right, this is wrong, because for each of us, it's different. We have to define our own boundaries. Absolutely. And if somebody keeps crossing those boundaries, then that's that's the red flag. This mm -hmm. person doesn't respect me. They don't value uh, my 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 space, my boundaries. And that's when you should get out. It's not a case of one strike and you're out. You know, right. you, you've got to decide your, okay, uh, three strikes. For me, right. it would be the three strikes, I think. Right. But, be, but up until that point, what you don't want to do is begin to reveal vulnerability. You don't want to reveal, you don't want to put forth that you are super kind and you're empathic and these are the hurts you've had in your life and you don't want to open up, which is something that um, people <laughs> who are dependent and who are empathic, yeah. uh, we tend Guilty. to God, that's yeah. our entire life. <laughs> Out, right this is what i've been through blah, 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 blah. Just, oh blah, my god you know. i'm laughing because i've i have been that person yeah uh -huh. <laughs> and and so and yeah and a, a predator will encourage that yeah. a predator will encourage that because that's how they gain information from you so you have to be really careful you've got to go slow with these things you know somebody that feels like they're whether it's a friend or a, a love interest or whatever somebody that feels like you know a perfect match for you or the perfect person that's 
that's something you have to be really aware of that mm-hmm. that doesn't happen that often. And relationships are built. You know, it's not like you're a teenager and you meet this kid and, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, we got the same thing coming in your best friends. When you're an adult, you 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 can't do that because you have a lot to risk. Yeah, so, I've, I've learned when I felt the sparks and the electricity and the chemistry, actually, those have been the most toxic relationships and the ones I've needed to run away from. And it's the ones that have been the slow burners where I'm like, no, nah, nah, you know, kind of take it or leave it. Those are the ones where there was the deep love there and there was, you know, real promise in the relationship. Yeah, I mean, I was... That's how I, w- I was into the, the, the bad boys for a long time, you know, <laughs> the bad boys. That's what I was attracted to. Yeah. And boy, did I get my heart broken and my life screwed up so many times because of that. And after a while you go, I can't do that anymore. I'm going to yeah. have to make a change because. <laughs> this isn't working. I need to change my approach. Right. Yeah. And what I tell people is, um, this is a good rule of thumb. Measure everything that you do in life against your future goals. So think about where you want to be in five years or 10 years or whatever. Um, and make sure that each person is part of that plan. If you don't think that that person is getting you or, or you know, that you want children in five years and. Mm. They're saying, well, we'll see, you know, we'll see, we'll think about it. But, you know, you want children and, you know, within the next five years, that person's not going to be the person, the best part of your plan. And you don't want to take a chance because you can throw away years on someone that's not going to get you. So, yeah, I mean, you've got to understand, you've got to figure out where you want to be. And that's how you measure um, relationships. So when we've gone through the love bombing stage that you know they've got you on side they've convinced you they're the one they're charming they're funny they're clever they're smart you know you're you're hot line and sinker you're like this is the one you're you're planning your future together then what will we say what what are the stages of that relationship okay so um a big part of the love bombing stage in um, phase in uh, romantic relationships is um, sexual intimacy. So narcissists want to get you in bed as quick as possible. And so because they're so charming, because you have met your soulmate, you let go. You just are like, uh, this is the person Body in the hands. you let go. <laughs> yeah. And so um, they do that because when when you have sex, there's hormones that are released that bond you to other people and also get you high, get you addicted. Mm-hmm. So they know that through this tactic, they can get you very addicted to them and bonded to them really quickly, mm-hmm. really quickly, which is why they want to do it so fast. So I always tell people, don't go to their house, don't go to your house, stay in neutral territory because the temptation is going to be too big, yeah. you know, uh, and you don't want to do that because you're locked. In. Once you do, you're locked in. But yeah. so they will be wonderful, perfect, everything that you've ever wanted. Um, what they're trying to do is get some sort of commitment to, from you, um, some kind of died in the wool statement that you're devoted to this relationship you're committed to it or um or they'll quickly they they want to get into a relationship very quickly okay so they try to rush through which is another thing to look for if somebody's rushing you very quickly um not a good sign you always want to take it slow and that's a good way to to determine if somebody is, is narcissistic because if you say i need to take this slow and they just can't handle it Mm. there's a problem there Um, but they need to move quickly because being kind being nice being charming is not their natural proclivity it's not who they are it's a total act and they mask and they can't keep the mask up yes they can't keep it up for long so they want to try to rush you so that they can let that go because the minute there's always a pivotal moment, it's either you say, I love you, you move in together, you get engaged, you get married. What, there's something that changes where that person goes, gotcha. Yeah. And the minute that happens, 
the mask comes off and this person comes out that you don't know. And <clears throat> because we don't understand how something like this could possibly happen, we begin to blame ourselves. We say, I must be doing something because I saw that perfect person. Mm -hmm. I know he or she is wonderful and has all these great, you know, attributes, qualities, yeah. qualities and all of these things. <clears throat> I know I saw it. I saw it. So if I <clears throat> only do this or don't do that <clears throat> or, um, you know, whatever, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. And I'm going to get that person back because they love me. I know they love me. Yeah. And I know that they have all these wonderful qualities. So we distrust ourselves. This is what we do. We start saying. Our, we so instead of actually accepting the person that is in front of you, you're hanging on to the person you fell in love with. Yes. And you're not, you're not accepting the person that now presents before you. Now that person, you know, whether they're a narcissist or not, whatever, you know, if a person has changed, then you know, by all means, there has to be a period of, because, you know, stress happens in relationships, life events happen, and people can become distant, angry, you know, there can be tension in relationships, that's being in relationship. But if, if that person is not coming back, or that, that glimmer of that old, or, you know, the core values that you fell in love with are not there, Right. then you're either dealing with a narcissist or you simply do need to get out of that relationship because it has become toxic, whether right. they're narcissistic or not. So, But, you know, what's different about that than a, a regular relationship with somebody who is not narcissistic or not personality disordered is it doesn't shift like that. Like there's a there's a total turn. So where where you were could do no wrong, now you can do no right. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, it's like everything you do is wrong. Everything you do is irritating. Um, and that person is gone. But it's impossible for us with our rational mind to accept that that happens because we can't imagine that we were in love with yeah. a with a we well, can't but you don't want to accept that you've been duped yep because that is a, because to accept that then everything was a lie about yep. the relationship and that's huge to accept that to to kind of get your head around it and think well was any of it true you know and the, the other thing of course is that they will still remain charming to everybody else, family members, to your friends, all the rest of it. So again, you're singled out thinking, oh, it must be just me. It's yeah. me. I'm at fault. We've got literally five minutes left. So <clears throat> the stage, so there's a the, the stage where there's the complete breaking down. So I mean that and bearing in mind this, you've got the love bombing. Then you've got the hook, line, and sinker. You've got your emotional hostage where you want. And then there's a stage where, are you just their plaything for them to, you know, you're, you're the, the fuel supply for them, but you're just there for their amusement, for their entertainment, for their supply, for, you know, to be controlled. I mean, is that what this is all about in any narcissistic relationship, whether it's the workplace, the family, the, the parents, the, the love relationship, the friend? Is it about control? Does that person just want to control you? They want to control you because there? they need to feed on you. You are fodder. You are narcissistic supply, which is food. You are the lifeblood of the narcissist. They rely on you for their every breath. Excuse me. And cat meowing in the yeah, I hear it's okay. <laughs> okay. Little kitty. Meow, meow. <laughs> um, they, they cannot function without constant narcissistic supply. So this is why they take on what we call relationships, but I call them hostage situations because we think we're in a relationship, but all they're doing is taking on somebody that they are going to systematically break down to the point where that person won't leave and they can keep feeding on them. And they feed on them through their reaction, through the person's reactions, their 
this roller coaster thing of, um, you know, uh, of them talking and saying too much and defending themselves. And it's, it's a, it's a total mess, a total mess. It's like all over the place. Um, but they keep you off balance because if you find your um, equilibrium, you may wake up to who they are. So they have to keep, they use all these tactics to keep throwing you. And just when you begin to get some clarity, because there will be points in which you wake up and you say, I think I see what I'm, what's going on. No sooner do you see it that you're completely talked out of it. And they do what's called intermittent reinforcement, which is they start being the person you want them to be because they have this ability to feel the change in you. So the minute you begin to wake up, they use intermittent reinforcement and they become, you know, the, they, they go back to the person that they it love, the way they love bombed you. Yeah, and you're like, bring oh, you back okay. in again. right. Yeah. Thank God. OK, OK, they're there. They're there, you know, but it's a cycle. It's a cycle where as soon as you catch on, they become who you want them to be. So it's very difficult to leave. Um it, this is hard, really hard to digest, but it's true, and it is very prevalent in society, and we all have to be aware of this. It's mm. so dangerous to us. Yeah, I'm very much conscious that time has run out, and we have got to a, quite a pivotal point in, I mean because there's so many stages there's a stage where they will continue to ma manipulate you but if you do start to get that clarity start waking up start questioning thinking and start showing signs that you might be leaving the relationship or getting ready to then that's a whole catalyst for another thing so there's two things that will happen they will either disregard you first so that they have the control and break you down in, in that. Right. But if you decide to uh, walk away from the relationship or divorce, again, they will systematically destroy you or aim to destroy you, no matter how long it takes, financially, emotionally, psychologically, in the divorce proceedings as Everywhere. well, because you abandoned them and how dare you. Even and, if they leave you first. Yeah, yeah. You abandon them because it's always your fault, no matter what happens. Okay. Even if they leave you, it's your fault that they left you. All right. So it doesn't make any difference whether you choose to leave or not. They, and, and I mean, then they will spend, I read in your book that they will spend up to six months preparing to leave you, you know, and they will oh. actually start telling people around, oh, oh, he's doing this or she's doing this. Oh, so yeah, that, they set it up. Yeah, they set it up. They, you know, they start siphoning off the bank accounts or, you know, the, the whatever it is to leave you with nothing. Right. So we're not going to get into that right now because we can't. We will we'll do part two of this divorcing a narcissist, walking away from a narcissist okay. next week. And about, you know, how to put in some healthy um tools and techniques to navigate through that because you have to do it in a certain way to protect yourself and it's vitally yeah. important that we, right. we protecting give protecting yourself that's that's a super important thing to say it's it's really important that you always protect yourself you cannot go out there just being this sponge and this open vessel you know you can't walk through life like that um it's unfortunately we can't do that so no, absolutely. Well, thank you again, Randy. And for everybody listening to this podcast, if you have been triggered, you've been upset, anything, or you think actually somebody else needs to hear this, please share this, you know, share it, because that is our aim of our work, to educate people about uh, narcissistic abuse to prevent this happening. So uh, please do hit the subscribe button, press the like button, do comment. If you've got any questions for us, put them in the comments below and we can respond. But And I just want to say very quickly, because people think when they, you know, if they would seek me out to help them, they think it's going to be years and a long drawn out pro 
mm. process. Um, I work very quickly with people to get them healed and on their way. Okay. So it's not, don't think if you reach out to me for help that you're going to be investing in a long, long process because I don't believe in that. Okay. No. So just so no, you know, it's that. very much about getting you back built up to your true authentic self as quickly as possible so exactly. thank you it's exactly. a good point to make and okay. do check out uh, randy's book close encounters of the worst kind do highly recommend it and her website is randyfine.com if you want to check out any of the change your world services and um, it's www.changeyourworld.me and I'm Susie Bowen. This is Randy Fine. And uh, you have been listening to the survival guide to narcissistic <laughs> abuse. <laughs> so thanks again, guys. Uh, love to you all. And thanks again, Randy. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.